Welcome to the services of Glendale Presbyterian Church, located at 9218 State Highway 83 North in Defuniac Springs, Florida. Sunday school is at 9.30 a.m. with Sunday services at 11 a.m. Wednesday night services are the first and third Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. It was Thanksgiving Day 2005 when someone brought me this copy of the USA Today paper. And usually I would go straight to the sports section. But something else caught my eye as I made my way through the pages, and that is in the middle of the first section, there's a two-page feature on folks in New Orleans who were recovering from Hurricane Katrina. And it really caught my attention because the, I noticed the area they were focused on was called Bank Street, and that's the street I grew up on. And then they focused those two uh, pages with pictures from people who lived in the 3500 block of Bank Street. That's the block I grew up in. And so it really got my attention. I even saw a picture of the guy who, who now lives in the house that I grew up in. We moved there when I was about six, and my parents were there all through my college years before they downsized. Uh, and I'm watching this, uh, I'm looking at this picture of this guy carrying stuff out from his house that was ruined, furniture and possessions that was ruined. Uh, the guy was uh, worked for a Lexus dealer. And it was just fascinating for me to house by house to see how people were recovering in the very uh, neighborhood I grew up in. People uh, found all kinds of different things after uh, Katrina. I'm sure Nam and Rocky could tell uh, stories as well. Now my sister's house out in Chalmette was completely covered with water. And so by the time they were able to come back to the house, uh, they found uh, the refrigerator was floating on its side. Uh, well, it wasn't floating anymore. The water was out of it by then. But refrigerator was on its side. There was all kinds of insulation from the attic had come down. It was all over the floor, as well as a ton of Mardi Gras beads <laughs> that they had stored up in the attic. And now they were just spread all over the place. Uh, but they lost everything. But you know, the most interesting story I read during those times of what people found when they came back to their house was that one family came back. And when they were allowed to get back in, they walked to their house and they found out another family was living in their house. And you know what they did? They just left and went somewhere else. Suppose that was you. What would you do if you went home one day and found somebody else living in your house? You kick them out? Would you uh, call the authorities and have to explain and document why that's your house? Of course, if it's in Walton County, you may have about a year of red tape to, to get back in your house. But, uh, you know, sooner or later, the, those authorities may ask for documentation. We need proof that this is really your house, that you bought and paid for this house. Well, that's the scene we come to in John chapter 2. Our reading picks up in verse 12. Uh, excuse me, we'll, we'll pick up in verse 13. Uh, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that as it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. 
So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But, John adds, he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. And we'll stop our reading there and once again ask for God's blessing. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for including this uh, passage in our scripture for this morning. And I pray that your spirit who inspired John to write these words, that that same Holy Spirit will make these words very relevant to us and meet us right where we are and give us the very things we need. We pray to that end in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus returns to his house and he finds it full of things that don't belong there. And he wants those things out. And so he proceeds to cleanse the temple. Now it's interesting to me that John puts this right at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. If you look back at the first part of chapter 2, it's when he did his first miracle there at the wedding in Cana. And then right on the heels of that is when Jesus goes to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. But the other gospel writers put the story of the cleansing of the temple... At the end of Jesus' public ministry, after he makes his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, right before the crucifixion. So why the discrepancy? This is what I think. I think it's describing two separate occasions. I think Jesus had to do it at the beginning of his public ministry, and he did it again at the very end of his public ministry. Three years apart. It was a lesson they didn't learn the first time. And so he had to teach them again. You ever have to teach your kids a lesson more than once? <laughs> Does God ever have to teach you a lesson more than once? We don't learn our lesson the first time. I know for me, sometimes it takes a while before I finally get it. Before I finally like, Lord, I learned my lesson. Please, I don't want to go through that anymore. So as Jesus returns to Jerusalem for the Passover, this has become an annual event for him. And not just him. Historians tell us over a million people would have been converging in on Jerusalem at Passover time. And when he arrives, John said he goes to the temple a place of worship, a place designed for God and men to meet together. But instead of finding it as a place of worship, he finds it as a place of merchandise. The religious leaders had turned this into quite a money-making effort. It had become known as Annas Bazaar. Annas was the high priest of that day, and it was named after him. And so this uh, marketplace was set up in the uh, court of the Gentiles, the outer, the outer place in the temple where the Gentiles could freely come in and out uh, to worship and to pray. And there in verse 14, John says, Jesus found men selling cattle and sheep and doves. Must have looked like a farm show. These animals were needed for sacrifices. But you see, the Jews wouldn't transport their own animals for over 20 miles. And so it was much more convenient to get to the temple and to buy your sacrificial animals there. However, it was just like when you go to some big sporting event or a concert or even a movie theater. They jacked the prices way up. That's what was happening here. 
They were ripping people off. And beside that, your money was no good at the temple. You had to exchange your money for temple money. That's why they had the money changers there. How convenient was that? Because chances were, one of your dollars would only buy about 50 cents worth of temple money. It had become a big money maker, and it was going on for years and years. I mean, suppose you showed up for church one Sunday morning, and there was tables set out out front, and somebody stopped you before you came in and said, hey, what kind of Bible do you have? And you, well, I have the latest ESV. Oh, I'm sorry, we only use the 1611 King James here. And you're like, well, I don't own one of those. Oh, it just so happens we can sell you one. We'll sell it to you right here. 1995. No shipping and handling charges. And you're like, okay, you pull out a $20 bill and they say, I'm sorry. We don't take that money here. We only accept Presbyterian coins with John Calvin's picture engraved on them. But you can exchange your money for those coins and you wind up going through that whole thing. That's the picture of what's happening here. There was a lot of business going on, but Jesus is about to do his father's business. Because when he saw what was going on, he wasn't a happy camper. He was livid. And he got angry over what he found. And so John says he began looking on the ground and picking up pieces of rope, probably pieces that had been used to lead those animals around to get them into the temple. And there he began to string together a, a, a whip. And John says, and with that whip, he drives out the animals, the cattle. And then he begins turning the, the tables over. Now, money exchange tables. Coins are flying everywhere. Remember, the animals were in there. So there are probably places on the floor where it wasn't very nice. Okay, you get the idea. It wasn't very nice. And now those coins are all over the floor. And you can see those people just scrambling in the midst of that mess, trying to uh, acquire and collect as many coins and rescue as many as they can. Verse 16, Jesus turns to the, to the ones selling doves. And he says to them, uh, take those things away. Get those things out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market. So much for Jesus being a mild, meek pacifist. This reminds me of a John Wayne movie. Uh, Jesus went ballistic and people were getting out of his way fast. But did you notice the emphasis in Jesus' words? Jesus said, this is my father's house. This is not your house. This is my house. And look at the response from those who are observing. Verse 17, Peter and the other disciples, their minds go back to one of the Psalms, Psalm 68, that is describing David's uh, passion, his zeal for the temple of God. And they make the connection there and they say, you know, we see in Jesus, just like in King David, a zeal for God's house, for God's place of worship. And when we come together on Sunday mornings, that's what should be our focus. We should be coming together. We should be coming together for worship. And when Kathy or whoever's playing sits to play the prelude, and I'm as guilty as this as the rest of you. There are some times when I'm not focused on worship. I'm focused on talking to people. And so I have to talk louder because now the music is playing from the piano. So I have to talk even louder. I'm going to work at that. And I hope we all will work at that. And kind of when that music, when that prelude starts, this kind of sort. Don't have to wait till Josh or Lee has to shout people to sit down and, and listen. 
kind of get in a, in a mood, get in a spirit of worship uh, during that uh, prelude time. John chapter 2, verse 18, look how the religious leaders responded to Jesus. Remember, he had just put an end to their money-making business, their enterprises. And they're like, who's this Nazarene coming into our territory, making such a commotion? Who gave you the authority to do this? What kind of proof do you have? What kind of sign can you show us to give us some kind of credentials? Show us a sign. Notice Jesus doesn't pull out his American Express card and say, hey, see who I am? No, no, no. He says, here's the sign. Here's the proof. I have the authority to do this. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. Now, the leaders assume he's talking about the temple they're standing in. And so you could probably hear the laughter in the background. Man, we've been working on this thing for 46 years, and it's still not even complete. And you telling us you're going to rebuild this thing in three days? And John adds the comment. Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. Remember, their initial question was this. Why should we listen to you? What authority do you have? What sign will you give us to show us that authority? Jesus answers, this is my sign. My death and resurrection will be the sign, will be the proof that I am the Lord, that I am God in the flesh, and I have authority to say what goes on in my house. So what's this got to do with us? Is the lesson that we just need to respect God's house, this place, this sanctuary. Is that the lesson? Oh, well, don't let kids run in here because it's God's house. Don't bring food or drink in here because this is God's house. Make sure everything's nice and proper. Here's a couple of questions for us to consider. First off, does Jesus feel welcomed at Glendale Church. And you say, well, of course he does, Pastor. I mean, after all, that's why we meet here. This is a church. This is the body of Christ. Of course, he feels welcome. But Isaiah the prophet wrote these words. Isaiah writes, the Lord said, these people honor, we, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And Jesus quoted those same words to the religious leaders. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You know those religious leaders? They were meeting at church every week. And yet Jesus didn't feel welcome there. And then the scripture in Revelation 3, which I think is probably one of the most misunderstood, misinterpreted verses in all the Bible. Where we read in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and will open the door, I will come into him and fellowship with him and eat with him and he with me. And all through my life, and probably all through your life, you've heard people use that verse to say it's describing Jesus knocking on, the, on a person's heart, the door of a person's heart, saying, please let me in. Please, all you got to do is open the door. Please let me into your life. But if you read the context of Revelation chapter 3, he's talking to the church. In fact, he's talking to the lukewarm church who was meeting every Sunday. And yet the lesson, the tragic lesson was Jesus was not meeting with them and they weren't even aware of it. 
So Jesus is on the outside of the church knocking. Please, all you got to do is let me in. I want to fellowship with you. And yet they continued in their lukewarmness. The tragedy of the church meeting together and Jesus being on the outside of that church. Wanting to come in, but not feeling welcome. How do we make sure that doesn't happen here at Glendale? We have to answer the second question. You see, this building, I've said this before, and you know this. This building is not the temple of God. God doesn't live here. Rather, God has a new dwelling place. We read about it in our opening scripture. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When a person puts their trust in Christ, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. He moves and resides within us, takes up residence. And when he does that, according to those verses we read in the opening scripture, our bodies are not ours anymore. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. He purchased it with the precious blood of Christ. It was a high price, but he paid it like the hymn writer said. Jesus paid it all. And so the most important question for all of us this morning is, does Jesus feel welcome in your life? And I think sometimes some get the idea that, well, I'm saved, but I can just kind of live my own life now any way I want to. I don't have to submit. But here's the thing. It's not your house anymore. <laughs> it's his house. By what authority does he have the right to tell us about his house? The same question the, Jews, the Jewish leaders asked. His death and resurrection gave him the authority to be Lord of every area of our life. It's his house. He paid for it in full. And because it's his house, he has the right to declare what should be in our life and what should not be in our life. You know how he deals with those things that don't belong? Same way he dealt with those religious leaders in the temple. Sometimes he has to drive those things out. Discipline. I'm sure we've, some of us in here have felt the discipline of God. I sure have. And it's not a good feeling. And in passages like Hebrews 12, the author says, God disciplines us as his children, not to be mean to us, but because he loves us. That's why fathers discipline their children. But instead of using a whip of rope, Sometimes he may use a whip of circumstances. He may bring things into our life to show us that those things need to, need to go. He's committed to do that. He has a passion to clear off the things in our life that don't belong. He also has other ways of dealing with things in our life. Things that are less painful. Remember what he told the, uh, the ones who were selling the doves. Just take those things out of here. Just do some, some housekeeping of your own. And God gives us the opportunity as his people to do that. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us those sins. Either way, he wants a clean house. He wants the things that he hates removed from his house. Whether it's through confession, whether it's through discipline, he will have his way because it's his house. And Paul's prayer to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3 is that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And you say, well, wait, wasn't he already talking to Christians? Yes. Wasn't Christ already in their life when they became Christians? Yes. But Paul's prayer is that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Paul uses a compound word there to mean uh, it means to be at home, to be comfortable, to be welcome. Is Christ welcome 
in your house. Or there are certain rooms that you close off to him, just like there are certain rooms when company's coming that you close the door to. At least we do that at my house. I don't know if you do it at your house. But there's some rooms where you don't want anybody to know what's in that place. And if there's areas like that in our life that we try to keep closed off to the Lord. This morning as we come to the Lord's table, I encourage, I encourage all of us, young and old alike, to take inventory of our life. And if there's anything there that doesn't belong, I encourage you to confess those things to the Lord as the elements are being passed out, as we quietly reflect on what God has done for us. Make a commitment. Lord, I want to deal with those things. I want to confess those things and get those things out of my house. I want you to feel welcomed in your house because it is your house. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit and shining a light down into our life sometimes in areas where we have neglected. And I pray that as your Spirit does that even this morning in our lives, that we will deal with those things that don't belong. It'd be so much better if we just dealt with them now and not have to wait for the discipline of the Lord to deal with those things. So Father, give us the grace to do that. And as we move into this time of communion, may you remind us that you call us to be clean vessels before you. We want you to feel welcomed in our lives. We want you to feel welcomed in this church. So, Father, we ask that you'll move among us in a special way this morning. As we celebrate all that Jesus has done for us, we pray it in his name. Amen. The Lord's words to those religi religious leaders, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. And as Peter watched Jesus cleanse the temple, he began to realize Jesus does have the authority to say what goes on in his house. And he realized eventually it was because of Jesus' suffering and his death that he purchased our redemption. He saved us. And Peter wrote about that later in 1 Peter chapter 1 where he says, we were redeemed not with silver and gold like the temple coins. He says we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Peter understood it was by faith that we receive his salvation. And so this morning as we come to the Lord's table, it's by faith that we receive these elements. Trusting that they're going to give us the spiritual nourishment that we need. 